Okay. I'm actually fairly decent at finding IEDs. I've found a lot the traditional way, but I've also, I've stepped on three IEDs and hit one tripwire. And one of them went off. That was my leg. One of them low ordered, mm -hmm. uh, just the blasting cap went off. Mm -hmm. And then two of them, they weren't armed. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so they didn't connect the batteries. So I can find them. I'm really good. Um, Crap pro magnet one. Probably not the preferred way, but it's a method. It's not the preferred, but it's a method. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever go to Chum Connie? Mm -mm. No. I was with Seventh Group in Chum Connie in 2007, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. Something like that. So, yeah. But that was probably a little earlier than you were. Yeah, I got into group um, 2009. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. So, what, like, if you were to give America a message out of your time here, mm -hmm. what do you think Americans don't get about this conflict? Mm. I'm not talking politics, I'm just yeah. talking about what, what is it Americans need to understand? Like, if we were to get involved here or, or not, um, what, is mm -hmm. it, what is it Americans don't know? Um... I would, I would say the biggest message for Americans from me is there is there's a lot more suffering going on here that is not being broadcasted. Imagine your entire life has been turned upside down. Your, ho your home is gone. Possibly family members are gone. You, everything that you've built up for however many years in the generation of your family has been destroyed by either this tank shell or this artillery round or any numbers of things. Now you're trying to get back to your home, but you can't because there's so many landmines and booby traps everywhere. Just the freedom of Americans, we, we don't have to live in fear of our next step, but a lot of the world does. And Ukraine is going, when this conflict is over, Ukraine is gonna end up being the most landmine country in the world where civilians here will be living in fear of their next step for a lot of years to come. So I would, I, I, I mean, my message, it's not really a message, it's more of an eye opener. Don't forget how good we have it. And as we get, you know, upset about our trivial, whatever it is, maybe the coffee is a little too cold or somebody cut me off, um, understand that there's a huge world out there and there's a lot of people that are really suffering mm -hmm. and they're suffering badly and it's in an area that is known for their harsh winters and guess what <laughs> winters here so I've known a lot of troops that have come back from Afghanistan and Iraq that have felt that way mm -hmm. and it's hard not to have some level of kind of resentment against Americans when you see you know like you know, I just came from wars, seeing the, the actual cost of our freedom. Mm -hmm. And you guys are sitting on it and watching TV or going to the mall. Or, I saw a, a sign up in a, a fob in, in um, Rig District, I think, that said, uh, America's not at war. The Marines are at, the Marines are at war. America's at the mall. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it seems like a lot of guys feel that way. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like it's refreshing almost to come here in a way to... to see people who want their freedom as badly as as you feel like Americans ought to so I have learned I've learned a lot from Ukraine and one of the biggest lessons that I've learned from Ukrainians is is that resolve that spirit but what I believe a lot of Americans were suffering from is this entitled victimization Everybody thinks they're entitled to something, and when they don't get it, they become a victim of it. Poor me, why me, how come me? And Ukrainians are refusing to become victims. I just went out and had a great night last night, you know, dinner and everything else, and there's no power. And all the other, you know, things that would be absolutely unacceptable in America. And Ukrainians are refusing to be victims of this conflict. They will. Um, they're going, they're, they're, they're not going to let, you know, uh, the Russians tear them down like that. And you can see it when you go to Bucha. I was in Bucha in, in, um, in April, April 10th, actually. And I thought, never, there is no way this, this place will have to be completely bulldozed and rebuilt. And then I went to it in August and I was like, wow, 
uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's some fighting spirit right there. It's not just battlefield fighting spirit. I'm talking about the Ukrainian spirit to never be a victim and to never give up. And that, I think, is a lesson that I would like to say Americans need to know, but it's unless you go through something like this, you're not going to know it. You know, it's you can talk it till you're blue in the face. It's just there's just so many um, things in America that will, you know, um, conveniences in America that that you just it's, it's impossible to teach a lesson like this too. This has already been costly for you. Um, you've lost a friend, I know, at least one um, mm -hmm. to this. And so I'd like you to talk about that, but also talk about it. it are you training the, the Ukrainians to do this mm -hmm. so that they can do this? You know, they, you, are, you, are you multiplying yourself on the battlefield? Now? Yeah, force multiplying. Yeah, that's, that's a green beret <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> through and through. Um, it's, it's all humanitarian demining. I don't do anything um, lethal. And so all of my training that I do, um, so I'll bring over, like, um, I bring over mine detectors. I have a Talon 4 bomb robot, all kinds of stuff, uh, almost $100,000 worth of equipment. And I don't just turn it over to anybody because it can end up on the black market quickly. So I will work with the unit and I'll see that this unit is legitimately trying to make Ukraine a better place or do their part. And then I donate all the equipment over I go back home and I refund raise again to do it all over again because it's not my equipment. Um, people donate out of the, uh, you know, out of the um, kindness of their hearts, and that equipment doesn't belong to me. It belongs to those guys that are continuing to make the area safe, which is force multiplying. So yeah, that's I mean that's what I base everything off of. It's it's not mine. Tell me a little more about your spiritual journey, how you came to your belief system. That so I, I've always grown up with a belief system from my dad. Um, my dad went through a really, <laughs> really rough, rough uh, go in life after Vietnam. And um, before he found God, his, his, his passageway to God um, was at the end of a shotgun, um, trying to get the courage to pull the trigger. And then somebody intervened who ended up being, you know, a preacher. and kind of went from there. But have I fallen away a lot in my life? Yes, I have, um, 100%. Um, but I've gotten to, I'm not gonna say the age now because it's not an age thing. I've gotten to the maturity level now to where I can actually see, okay, there is a reason why I'm still here. Um, I, sh I should have died in Chichi River Valley, but I did it. So. There's a purpose. That purpose isn't, you know, um, well, I didn't really know what that purpose was until again, I got over here and then all of a sudden it made sense to me. And then once I started understanding that these doors had opened up, I quit, I quit my job as a government contractor making extremely good money. And I came over just, I didn't know anybody. I just had one guy who's like, yeah, I have some friends with a missionary group in Kiev. You want to go help? And I was like, uh, well, oh. I mean, do I just go? Doors were opening up where I was too blind to see them or too immature to see them in my past. Mm -hmm. And now I can see the doors that God opens up for me. And it's, it's taken that, that, that courage to step through the door because everything is a vulnerability thing. And before, I never liked to be vulnerable, but I've recently learned in my life, there is extreme strength through vulnerability. And to make myself vulnerable, understanding that I could fail, I could get hurt, I could, I, you know, this could be a complete, you know, um, catastrophe, I don't know. But if I don't try, then I'll never know. And if I don't know, it's because I didn't try. And that's all on me. And that goes back to those middle pages of your book. How are you, you know, is your, is your story going to be worth reading in the end? Mm -hmm. And so I've learned strength through vulnerability, um, which, you know, I battle with it all the time. You know, it's, but that's, hum that's called being a human being. But I would say I've recently figured out my purpose. And my purpose is helping people. And <laughs> to the best of my ability, I try and follow what God wants me to do. But sometimes I'm so bullheaded, I don't, 
I walk into the wall and not the open door right next to it. And I just keep walking to the wall because no, 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 I know best. I know best. I know best. So, yeah. but I look back on my life and I look back about how everything came from basically September 12th, 2010, when I got blown up, tell where it is now. And I firmly believe that that IED saved my life. So it's a weird way of looking at it, but I think, I think God was saying, hey, you're not listening to me. So I'm gonna make this hurt really bad because you're that dumb, but you're gonna do something with this. And now I think I see what, what his uh, message was. My grandfather used to say that God's will for you is for you to be on your knees so that you can get to know him better. Mm -hmm. It sounds like maybe he had to take your feet out from under you to get you there. Oh, he did. <laughs> that was uh, quite a, Quite a uh, quite a wake up call. I've talked to a lot of people that have been through that, mm -hmm. who have said years later, I, I've actually come to be grateful for it in a way mm -hmm. because I because of what the path that it set me on. You know? yeah. yeah, I believe I'm, I, I believe fully that I actually started living my life after I almost died. Um, you know, have I made a lot of mistakes since then? Oh yeah, human being, but. I can look back on the path from September 12, 2010 to where I am right now sitting here talking with you guys and I can see the purpose of it all now. Yep. And then I can trail all that back to my childhood and why I have the compassion for you know civilians and the children and stuff that I do. Now it all makes sense. It's really weird how God does it. Yeah, he just <laughs> mixes it all together and it, all your training is meant for the mission he has for you. Yes, for correct. Mm -hmm. And everything, all that stuff that happened before is just training. Yeah. What he's training, what the training you're doing now is for what he has for you next. Yeah. Who knows what's so. uh, Tell me about the guy that got killed. I just want to make sure I get that in there. Yeah. So, Victor, um, I worked with Victor for the month of August and I was out at his location. Um, and I left, uh, I left the 2nd of September and Vic, they had, uh, Ukrainians were doing a push on a Zoom and um, his unit was coming in to, I, I can't quite remember what they were, they were all part of the, the effort. I don't think he was the main effort, but they had had a guy that was injured. So they went to go retrieve him. And as they were moving back, um, they tripped a um, Palm II uh, mine, which uh, killed him and another guy and then wounded two other guys. So um, it was bad, it was a bad situation, but yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of them out here. And that would have been you if you had still been there, probably. Yeah, I try not to. I try not to. What it could have, should have. Yeah, yeah. It's the it, fact of the matter is it wasn't. Um, and you know, I I believe again, there's there's lessons in everything. Um, but you know, for me, it's it it's you know pretty much trying to make sure that those lessons learned from how Victor died, I can impart those on other guys that maybe. Maybe it is, you know, your zero, you know, your zero fives, twenty fives, or whatever. You're you're checking your your uh, your AO a little bit more, mm -hmm. um, something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, the the missile uh, or the missiles, the mines that Russia, well, that both sides, I guess, are putting out. Um, it sounds like they're not marking them. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. they don't have. They're not mapping them. They're not. But American mines will automatically deactivate after a period of time. Mm -hmm. It sounds like these are going to be out there forever unless somebody like you goes and gets them. They're going to be out there for a lot of years, and they are not marking the minefields um, either side. It is indiscriminate um, usage of landmines, and unfortunately, it goes back to what I, you know, I think everybody here agrees with: is the civilians that are paying the ultimate price for it. Um, but a lot of Ukrainians are hitting their own mines too, and it's heartbreaking because it's it's completely preventable. Mm -hmm. um, but I think all of us have heard about the Ukrainian units that have hit their own mines because they just weren't tracking that minefield. Mm -hmm. um, Russians too. Well, let's hope that they get better at that for sure. Yeah. Excellent. Um, How do you find a mine and deactivate it? It depends on the mine, but like the TM62 anti-tank mine, um, it's a very, it's a super high metallic hit. So, I mean, the metal detector is going to catch it. Um, five feet above it, you're gonna start getting chirps on it. Mm -hmm. um, but then I'll uncover it, I'll check you. Well, 
once I get the solid hit, um, I'll uncover a, pe or a little bit of it. Okay, this is a mine. Then I'll check my area for secondaries, which would be anti-personnel mines. And then I, now that I know that I have some working space, then I'll start to uncover around the mine to look for booby traps, the anti-lift, the anti-tamper devices. And um, then- Have you found any? No, oh, no. So it doesn't sound like they're using a lot of those? In some areas they are. Some areas they're using tons of them. In other areas, like if they were machine laid, mm -hmm. then no. Um, they're just they're just trying to put out hundreds of them and you you know we're gonna lay thousand of them you may find 999 we're gonna get you with you know 1,000 um, the Russians and the Ukrainians both utilize mines the same way as the Russians utilize manpower I'm gonna throw a hundred thousand guys at you and hopefully something will happen um, but yeah and then I'll just connect around the fuse and I'll conduct a remote pull um, in case there was something underneath, because the Russians do like to put hand grenades underneath the mines. Um, and I'll conduct that remote pull. And then if we're good, I'll unscrew the fuse. If it doesn't go off? Yeah. Yeah, if it doesn't go off, then I'll unscrew the fuse and then move on to the next one. Once you unscrew the fuse, then it's like a paperweight. I can, I could literally use it as a hammer. You can, can get that on the airplane. You can get it through TSA. I would love to see you do it. <laughs> <laughs>